Hello and welcome everyone to the CBI at 10. I'm James Harding. I'm the editor and co-founder of Tortoise. And as you all know by now, uh, we get together with the CBI to try and understand some of the big and pressing issues that face business in the UK. And you might argue that the one that we're going to discuss today is as big as it gets and as pressing as it comes uh, and has been so for decades. And it's the question of how do we make prosperity much more available to everyone across the country? How does business engage in the government's agenda of leveling up? As you'll know with these CBI conversations, we really want to make sure we hear from businesses. It's an exchange. But today in particular, given the extent to which the CBI is really seeking to put its shoulder into the question of how business engages regionally, Tony Danker, the CBI Director General, has really made it his mission to try and promote the idea of regional competitiveness. We're really lucky to be joined by Stephanie Hyde, who's the CEO of JLL, but for the, our purposes today is also the relatively newly appointed Stephanie uh, Chair of the Thriving Regions and Nations Committee for the CBI. Um, uh, I'm going to say congratulations, Stephanie, and then we'll find out, of course, in the next 45 minutes whether that's the right thing to say. Uh, and Ahmed Goga, who, who it is the right thing, good, good, okay. And, uh, and Ahmed Goga, who uh, is in charge of uh, regional policy for the CBI. Ahmed, thanks so much for making the time this morning. And if we we're a minute or two late, it's because we were kind of lost down memory lane. It turns out that Stephanie and Ahmed uh, were at university together. Stephanie studied maths and management. Ahmed studied politics and history. And so the point is, if these two can't figure out how we make leveling up work, we're, you know, we're really not in a very good place. So we're going to get after that this morning. St Stephanie, can I start? Because I suppose, you know, I imagine when you get the call from the CBI, it's a bit like national service. You know, you sort of feel like you have to take it. But on this particular issue, where there's so much political attention, what do you think the CBI's role is? What do you think your role on this new committee is? Can you just sketch out a little bit about what you're trying to do? Yes, well, thank you. Look, I, I think the most important thing is we've been talking about this for many, many years and now feels like the right time to actually be getting traction on it. Um, the government can't do this alone. They can't do this without partnership with business and the level of commitment that the CBI is putting to this and the focus that it's giving it and actually simplifying and being clear about the approach that we could take to make this successful really did uh, appeal to me to get involved with. I was flattered to be asked. I do recognize it's, uh, it's a challenging subject. It's something I'm very passionate about. I've been uh, passionate about it for many years. I um, led the regional business at PwC, which had offices all over the country for six years. I think I did that role and getting out and about and seeing what was happening. It was so different to what was happening in London and the Southeast. And, I saw the level of pride that people had in their local areas, in some cases, despite some of the challenges that they were experiencing and the frustrations they were feeling. And so it's something that I've carried for many years. And now I've moved to JLL a year ago, actually seeing the difference that um, real estate makes in that, in, in creating placemaking. Um, we've been involved in projects like Canada Water, Kings Cross, York Central, and you can see the difference that reinvigorating a place can make. So it felt like there were a number of things coming together and it was a, a real opportunity to get involved. Uh, and Stephanie, we'll, we'll get into, I hope in a minute, a sort of set of quite pesky questions about whether or not the levelling up agenda can work, how it works, how business engages with government and policy makers. Um, but Ahmed, I just wondered whether or not I could effectively ask you the sort of inside CBI question which is what the what the policy is. I think, you know, as I said, I think Tony's really sort of focused on this, but in concrete terms, what does thriving regions and nations mean? Well, James, I think, uh, it, it, as Stephanie said, this is, this is a really exciting agenda, you know, and in many ways, it's at the core of everything we do as a CBI. We want to make sure with the, uh, the uh, authority and the, uh, uh, relationships and the national uh, uh, capability that CBI can bring in, in, in discussions and also with our relationships. We want to bring that overall firepower of CBI 
and make sure that every region and nation of the country is firing on all cylinders, that they can harness and marshal the, the assets and the capability and the economic potential that they have in their individual localities and really power it up. And that is about bringing uh, a whole range of assets and partnerships and really focus them within the regions. In many ways, we want to bring our national agenda and make sure it's hitting in every part of the country. And if we can do that, we believe there is a latent capability, billions of pounds of economic value that can be unlocked across every part of the country into the national economy. And if you think about it in those terms, this is a truly historic and national prize if we can get it right. And that's why we think this is a national mission. And that's why we think this is of absolute national calling right now in the context of our economic situation as well. And Omid, will you just spell out for people, what is the CBI's clusters program? Yeah, so there's a number of elements to thriving regions that we're looking to do. One of those is about a, a really powering up economic clusters. We think that cluster policy and cluster development can actually really create new areas of economic opportunity within regions. And also where those uh, clusters of businesses exist, we think we can scale them up to be genuinely competing at a national and international level. And the idea is we bring together businesses that are of like-minded uh, uh, um, economic need and, uh, and um, capability. They might be in the same technologies, they might be uh, sourcing similar supply chains, they might be located in the same sector or technology as well. And we think by bringing those together in a geography, we can really harness the opportunities around co-investment, collaboration, and also greater innovation that will create new jobs and also new economic value products and services as well. We can get that right. It's been proven in every other part of the world that if you can deliver that at scale, you can deliver significantly new industries, technologies and jobs as well. And how does the CBI role their work between being, if you like, an exchange for best practice and advice and information and the ideas that Tony mentioned in his conference speech, do you remember at the end of last year? Yeah. About, okay, let's take a couple of examples and really see if we can learn from doing it. So there's a number of things that are coming together right now, James, which I think, which is why it's so exciting. Um, if you look at it from a from an economic point of view, whilst the, we have some really significant headwinds at the moment that we, we are potentially going to be facing uh, and which we've heard in the recent spring statement as well, underneath those things, there are still substantial ambitions within business to invest. There is substantial investment ambition uh, and, and also we know that investors are looking to land investments into the UK. We just had the best 12 months of foreign direct investment that the UK has had and in many technology sectors as well, where we are market leaders or have the potential to be global leaders. So there is a real latent underlying demand. Now, what we need to do is try and unlock that private sector investment, and that needs working with government to try and build up confidence, to give businesses that surety to, to really focus. But also what I think the, the calling right now is, is because we can accelerate some of that work, if, uh, and that could actually provide us with new opportunities in net zero, and in new technologies as well, if we can get it right. And businesses are looking for that really key part. And so what the clusters work and the thriving regions work can do is harness that overall private sector ambition, bring businesses together to attract that investment, and also project our UK opportunities on a global scale as well. And, and Stephanie, I said we'd sort of get into actually the levelling up agenda as a whole. I, I realise the CBI is in this sort of, as always in this really difficult position, which is it wants to engage businesses, engage government, kind of bring them both together. And to do that, it's got to be critical of where the gaps are and constructive. You know, there's a kind of path to, I know that. But, but just standing, given that you're in this position where if you're like looking at it from the outside in, when you think about the levelling up agenda itself, when you looked at the white paper, what did you make of it? How did that chime with what you think or your experience of, you know, regional differentials in the performance of the economy in the UK? Well, I thought it was uh, interesting in a number of ways. I thought it was a, a good place to lay out exactly what the government's view was of where we are and where they would like to get to. It was relatively silent on the role that business needs to play on purpose, I understand, because it, it, it felt that wasn't really the role of what they were trying to do there. They were trying to put out the government's view. 
I initially was a bit concerned about the missions, but having reflected on them, I think they're a good stake in the ground for the future. We need some visible kind of KPIs, a North Star, as it were, for um, a, a focus for, for generations, hopefully, to understand how we are moving things forward. Even if there's a target for 2030, realistically, it, it put us at stake of what, it, what is actually overall trying to be achieved. I was uh, interested that for me, probably two areas where we can call them gaps, but we can also call them opportunities. Skills is something that I see is very, very critical to the overall achievement of the goals here. Um, ultimately, when we help companies think about where they're locating or when uh, overseas investors are coming in, skills is probably 75% of the decision that they make because they need that clustering of skills and expertise in order to feel comfortable to invest. And then the other, the other area that I thought, again, is a real opportunity, if you want to look at it that way, and I, I tend to, is um, really green jobs. Yeah. Um, there could have been a lot more in there on net zero. And, and if you think about the ambition to really place the UK in a competitive position internationally and for our towns and cities to compete on an international stage rather than with each other or within the UK, net zero and the whole green economy is somewhere where we can make a huge difference. So I guess the reflections there are about some positives as I read it and some opportunities too. And how much, Stephanie, are we... Do you remember when David Cameron launched the Big Society? And at the time, there was so much political discussion about it. And then, of course, we were in the middle of a financial crisis. And the reality was that that felt like a luxury that we just couldn't afford, given the scale of the financial crisis. How much is the cost of living crisis, the inflationary pressures, the energy shocks? You're the CEO of a company. How much do you think there's going to be bandwidth for serious thinking about economic restructuring and new geographical investment, given what business is facing this year? Yeah, look, I, I mean, nobody can really underestimate the, the shock that we've seen off the back of Brexit, off the back of the pandemic, and now with what's going on, particularly the you know, terrible situation in Ukraine. It's something you cannot dismiss and you absolutely need to, to be focused on but not at the cost of everything else. And we've got to understand the implications of the long-term agenda here as well. If we had had success at that point in time, if the financial crisis hadn't come along, if it wasn't as politicised, we would be in a much better position to deal with the cost of living crisis and with the energy issues that we're seeing. Um, so I, I think we, we can't let it hold ourselves back. We need to take the lessons of that, that we could be in a very different position now if we had moved forward and find the energy to continue to dedicate to it. Uh, and can I just pick up on your point about skills? Because I think it, it was interesting in the last couple of annual conferences of the CBI, actually what you hear, there is a real drumbeat around skills. And you know, you put it kind of generously that there was a opportunity there to think more about skills. If, you, if, if it was Stephanie Hyde's levelling up white paper, how would you have addressed that? What would you have thought businesses wanted to see, regions wanted to see in terms of investment or support for skills? Yeah, again, really interesting point, because I think most businesses would say that actually business needs to step up as well on the skills agenda, whilst schools and colleges and you know universities have an absolutely clear role to play i think businesses need to be clear about the direction that they're heading in and the skills that they're looking for and work with government again it's back to that partnership um, and get that concentration of effort in in areas things like apprentices have been incredibly successful for companies but there's a lot more that we can do to really up the agenda so i it could have gone further to have talked about how it would uh, how the white paper felt that skills could have been developed, but I think this is a real opportunity for business to come forward in partnership and be clear about the skills for the future. I mean, I mean can I just go on the, C on the CBI side? One of the things that always I thought was really interesting about the CBI, it's one of the few organisations in the country to work at the BBC, it was another, where you actually have that convening power regionally and in the nations, of course. Can you just tell us a little bit, if you're, if you're a business 
who's kind of listening to this and thinking, what have they got some guy on from London talking about this for? We, we're living and experiencing this in X place or Y. How do you get engaged with the CBI so that you're actually feeding into what this thriving regions policy might be? Yeah. By the way, this guy's actually in the West Country and in the great city of Gloucester. This was, uh, and this, this was a mayor and, 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 and I'll tell you why it matters as well, because um, I passionately believe about, uh, about our regions and our nations and their actual potential. And every day, businesses in, in, in other, all across the country are, are making transformative decisions for people's lives. Businesses create jobs, businesses create wealth. They care about their communities. And that's why this matters so much for every member of the CBI and how businesses make a difference. They are doing that right now. And what we're asking now is for businesses across the country uh, through our, our regional councils and working with our regional directors and our brilliant teams in the regions, we want to really scale up the voice of regional businesses. Uh, we want to get them visibly involved in the work that we're doing. We want to bring their opportunities and their investment potentials to the fore because we think that every business has the potential to really uh, play, have a role to play. Uh, we've just talked about skills as an example of that. We think businesses can really step up in working with schools not just in terms of things within the schools around um, work experience, these sorts of things that are happening all the time, but we want more businesses to be involved in, in governing boards to really help uh, schools to really think about how uh, the schools can run, operate, and start to deliver uh, um, uh, education outcomes that work for, for the local business community. We also want businesses to get involved because we want to identify the investment opportunities that investors are seeking to land. Uh, the white paper, for example, has identified for the first time pension funds and institutional investors committing at least 5% of their investments into regional projects. Now, we think that could expand significantly, and we've spoken to CBI members, and they are very keen to accelerate that level of investment. So we want to find out from businesses and regions where those investments could be, what those opportunities are, and how we can really uh, power them up quickly and to elevate them at a national level. And also, I think it's really important for, for businesses in the regions as well. There's a sense of, of role to play in shaping your communities and shaping your, your place. Um, businesses can really define what the story is for a geography, for a location. What's their, their, their raison d'etre, why this place matters. Um, and they can bring the DNA of a place and the, you know, the vitality that comes with it. And we want more businesses to articulate what their vision is for their lo locality, what their vision is for their region, because every place is going to have to set that out to attract investors moving forward. It's a really key part, sometimes overlooked. When investors are looking, as Stephanie said, a lot of it's an emotional uh, relationship. Can they see themselves located there? Can they see themselves embedding for a decade or more and really make the, the place the hub for their business operations? That matters in decision making. And so we want every region and with businesses in those regions start to articulate what it is about their hub, what is about their location, why that's the place where people should settle, but, you know, uh, retain talent and then build careers as well. Cool. Can we just, I want to come in a moment to Stephanie's point about kind of a government lens on levelling up and metro mayors and the way in which, you know, Michael Gove frames some of the practical changes. But I just think it's worth it's possible to stick with this question of clusters. What yeah. you were talking about, um, Edward Morris put this question in, which was, is the government signed up to the principle of clusters? And the, uh, and the point, he, I mean, it's a question, but I think he's got a point behind it, which is, as its policy seems to run counter to it, right, i.e. Channel 4 has gone to Leeds, not to Salford, and the Great British Rail HQ competition is not for an existing rail hub. And so do you think that, do you think that, you know, exactly as he put it, do you think the government's really signed up to clusters? I think we take the government at face value and I think we work from policy to policy um, and we have great dialogue with, with, with uh, the ministerial teams as well to push the case forward wherever we can. On clusters, there are a couple of things that make me very optimistic. First of all, the white paper very clearly articulates the importance of the clustering and the need to really scale up those that exist already. And, and they also reference the work that CBI are doing. And we've got some very good discussions taking place with uh, the minister's team in the business department about how we can collaborate on that. So I'm very positive about that. I think the second thing to say also is that the investments that are taking place within uh, the regions are also with a view to think about how we can grow and in many cases, increase the density of that business capability. So for space sector as an example is really worth thinking about. 
space and satellite technologies might sound something ethereal to many people. It's something that you know they watch on on science fiction or something abstract, usually about Major Tim Tim Peake going into space or something like that. Satellite technology is going to be absolutely transformative in the way we 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 live and work. It's already doing that now in terms of global telecommunications, but also in terms of our fight against climate change and also in our thinking about our food and our agriculture, maritime and a whole range of transport networks and systems as well. It is a massive industry that's only going to increase and the UK are at the vanguard of that technology. Now, that sector is actually investing more in the regions than most others. So you have the opportunity to really grow clusters in Cornwall, up into Scotland as part of the spaceports, the East Midlands in through Leicester, and also um, supply chain technologies that are going to be permeating in the Northwest and also in the South of Wales Valleys as well. All together with the R&D hub that's located within Oxford around the Harwell campus, which is Europe's largest space cluster. That is a UK asset that is of international significance. And right now, that cluster is taking the fight in Ukraine with the satellite technology at Elon Musk and OneWeb and others are doing it at the moment as well. It is an example of how we can really leverage, you know, real high value technology into every region if we can make this work. And that's why I think the cluster strategy is really something we should really get our shoulder behind. And James, just to jump in, I was just thinking that to some degree this happens naturally because when a big business or a number of businesses invest in the same area, you see their supply chain build. I think the difference here is how do we accelerate this by doing it consciously? How do we really think it through and be clear about it so it's not happening by osmosis over many years but it's it's being accelerated that's that's the real perhaps potential so, so can i let, let, let's can we just get stuck into the theory of this for one minute though david crichton miller um put, puts this great point he says look beyond the phrase clustering which is a version of the outcome we want to deliver does the CBI have a theory of what government interventions are needed in what ways to achieve greater clustering or clustering in places where it is not yet occurring powerfully? Yeah. It, it, he goes on and I'll share his point with you afterwards. But what, what's your, uh, Ahmed, what is your answer to that? It, d does the CBI have a theory of the case? Yeah. Yeah. So there are a number. David's got a fantastic question. It's not a one hit. It's multiple interventions that have to happen. And almost sometimes it's by luck. That these come together as well but let's work on the art of the possible first of all we need absolutely much better competitive finance in place in every part of the country so that businesses particularly scale-up companies that have the technology but have the need the necessary finance to grow and accelerate that investment we've got a competitive financial environment in which businesses can access that resource over a consistent period of time not just at particular uh, journeys, but right the way through the spectrum of that growth as well. And we haven't got enough of that in every part of the country. So that's the first thing. The second thing is absolutely, we need uh, a really robust and dynamic planning and land use uh, approach where we can utilize the planning system and also allow investors to plan with confidence so that significant investments of scale that enable some of these clusters to grow at pace can happen. Life science is a great example where we have got amongst the best in the world but we have got a deficit of lab space and, and flexible uh, R&D space that we need urgently to capitalize on some of the brilliant stuff that's going on, not just with the vaccine technology, but what that's created as a consequence as well. Um, mm -hmm. And you compare us to say Boston, Boston have got uh, 100 million plus in terms of square foot, we have got in the tens of thousands. And that's just an illustration of having a really dynamic planning and land use approach as well. The third thing is talent, absolutely key. We've got to invest in skills, We've got to have skills at every level of that journey, not just young people coming into the system and creating pathways into these new opportunities, but we need to have really good leadership and management programs that can really provide the capability at the top team level as well. And then the fourth thing I would say is our digital infrastructure as well. Absolutely critical, not just in terms of transportation, but also our, our high quality 5G and other technology infrastructure that can really provide the necessary connectivity that we need as well. So those are just four things that every to, you know cluster will absolutely need and we need to get that integrated thinking right across the departments to really come behind that agenda as well so, stephanie can, can i just follow up just i guess take the spirit of david's question too you know in terms of theory of the case because when something like this becomes if you like conventional wisdom 
we must level up. Clusters are going to be the way that are going to drive regional competitiveness. It is somewhere just worth stopping and going, that's not necessarily the view, certainly not the view of all businesses, who for years would have said, look, the job of the CBI is to make sure the macroeconomic conditions are as positive as possible for business. Let's make sure the government gets out of the way. I'm paraphrasing or caricaturing here, but government gets out of the way. You know, the tax environment is, you know, reasonable and then let the market do what it does. We don't want government, you know, A, picking winners or B, picking places. And clustering is the business of picking winners and places. And so do you hear anything from CEOs saying, look, I'm really worried about this. This is a lot of people with very good intentions who are going to end up with a, a, a bunch of wasted money or effort. I'm still reminded to talk about the definition of insanity, where we try and do the same thing over and over again and expect a different outcome. So I think this is trying something differently to get a different outcome. And as I said, it's building on something that happens relatively naturally, but relatively slowly as well. I don't think it's the only way of levelling up, and I don't think anyone's saying that it is, but it's a way of accelerating and getting focus. And I think the difference here and what the CBI is trying to do, and indeed the role of the steering committee as well, is to think about how it's not just the government saying this is what this place is going to be famous for, um, but business gets involved in that discussion. So putting in local leadership, um, encouraging more devolution, which the government is trying to do, we've seen that working. You have a leader that you can go and talk to, an Andy Street, a Howard Bernstein, somebody you can go and talk to who can have a vision and who can bring people behind them. They didn't come up with that vision on their own. They didn't come up with that just with a public sector lens. They've done that by talking to businesses. So I think, again, this is back to partnership and it's about, it's not being done to an area. An area is having the opportunity to be given the platform to move itself forward, is how I would see it, with business working alongside, not behind it, not in front of it, but alongside it. No, I, I, I completely get your point about this about Andy Streets and the Bernsteins. I, I think, if anything, the last few years has meant that devolution, which felt like it was a subject for a certain group of wants and political nerds, and probably you, Armin, have <laughs> talked about it more than it's healthy. But, but it's suddenly something that I think we all really care about because we see the power of those people to actually lead and bring people together. Uh, Armin, can you just talk through that element of the levelling up white paper? Yeah. What it means if you're a place that's getting a metro mayor, what you think that will mean to the way in which clustering and participation of business happens, but will you also just address what happens if you're in a region that's not getting metro mayor, and what do you think are going to be the levers and organisations that do that convening? Yeah, I, I, I mean the CBI absolutely supports the, the, the proposition to increase the number of mayors across the country as well. We think it's a very strong uh, model of leadership. We think that, as Stephanie has said, it, it provides a real focal point for businesses to work alongside and and to also um, really engage with. We think we can do more. Um, we're very keen to deepen our relationships with every mayor across the country, and we're looking to really strengthen those partnerships so that they are real le national leaders as well as regional leaders as well. That's something that we're, we're going to be doing a lot more with each of the mayors moving forward as well. I think it's really key. Uh, uh, regardless of whether you've got a mayor or not, and this I think is the thing about stories, is really being clear about what your area is about and being able to describe your place over the next 15, 20 years and your ambitions around how you want to get there as well. That is really important regardless of whether you've got a mayor or not. Um, and businesses will have a, a role in engaging in that work all the way through as well. And I think the challenge I would give to regional leaders, whether you've got a mayor or you're not, is how well are you engaging with your business community and your business leaders and your senior business leaders uh, in your localities? Are you really drawing on their insights, their, their strong um, uh, uh, perspectives in terms of long-term investments and also how communities and places can help to be built and developed as well? We want to see a much deeper relationship on that because we think now is the moment we need, need to double down. And as Stephanie said, we do more of the same. We're only going to get the same results, which is why our challenge uh, to all aspects of, of governance, whether it's a devolved nation or whether it's within the regions as well, we want stronger, deeper and much more substantial engagement with our business leaders.
Stephanie, the, the, there was a question from Jim Clark, which is about the resourcing of leveling up. And it was interesting when you talked about the things, you know, you were pretty candid about the things that you would have sort of hoped to see more of. Would you have hoped to see more money? So initially, again, when I first read the report and heard some of the headlines, I thought, or when I heard the headlines rather than I actually had a chance to sit and reflect and look at the report in detail, I thought yes, right? And I, I, I was concerned that this had been watered down from where some of the hope and aspirations of many people were placed. But having spoken actually to Andy Haldine, understanding the refocus that's going on, there's a lot of money spent by different government departments. And the idea is that there is this, this refocus and this shift in terms of making sure that it's more evenly distributed or more focused in specific areas. I think that is a source of, a huge source of funds anyway. But ultimately, in, in the real estate world, I see so much money wanting to invest so much opportunity for people actually wanting to invest what they need is something to get behind that has a clarity and it has a a reassurance that the investment is not going to be misplaced through great planning through a clarity of direction you know even the fact that we've named the three areas of of you know wolverhampton and and um blackpool um it is just I've got the third just gone out of my mind. Doesn't that always happen Sheffield. when you say three things? Sorry? Sheffield, I think, was the third one. Sheffield, of course it's Sheffield. Uh, I shouldn't have said the three and then it wouldn't have happened, right? So, um, but those three areas, the fact that you've got clarity that that's where the government's saying, why don't we start there? Why don't we push on there? Helps business then get focused around that and think, does that work for us? You know, the aerospace that's in Wolverhampton, is that something that we can get behind? There'll be different industries and different supply chain pieces looking at that. So, um, I think there's plenty of money out there in investment actually waiting to happen. What's needed is that clarity. Uh, that, that's, I think that's really interesting and I'm really struck by, in fact, I thought it was quite interesting, one of the themes of the Spring Statement, the chance of the Spring Statement was this question of how do you get private sector capital behind public priorities? And it feels like that's going to be just this recurrent theme, isn't it? Definitely leveling up. Can I, there are, there are a bunch of comments and questions, Ahmed, which I was going to, if I might, just pull together and put to you, yeah. which are, if you like, the sort of opportunity cost of clustering and the leveling up agenda. One is, uh, and I think, I hope I'm going to get this right, one is the sort of Michael Hurst point that's been made in the chat which is look if you're leveling up some places what's the risk that you're leveling down i know that this is kind of unfashionable to say but there are people in london and the southeast who are saying you know we completely get the arguments for leveling up but there's a regional competitiveness argument but there's also a global competitiveness yeah. argument and within london and the southeast there are great inequalities and London's competitiveness with capitals around the world can't be forgotten. So there's the leveling up, leveling down question. Yeah. Then, then there's a really, really interesting point that, um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to do these at you together, Ahmed, just because mm -hmm. we're aware of time. Sure. There's a really interesting uh, point, which is what happens if you're in a sector that is, if you like, a cluster, but it's not geographically a cluster. Yeah. If the retail resorts business that goes all the way around the coast of the UK, it, it, economically it's a cluster, but it's not geographically. How does the yeah. process address that? And then what about areas that don't obviously sit in clusters that are particularly remote? You know, Ruth Gawthorpe asks about, you know, what if you're building businesses in parts of Cornwall that don't naturally fit just for reasons of geography and demography? So will you just think about those three things for us? Yeah, so um, first of all, in terms of um, leveling up, leveling down, I am absolutely at one with that question. We cannot deliver this mission if, our, if the outcome is to make our best performing areas suddenly become much lower down the league table. We cannot achieve leveling up if London isn't the best global city in the world. And we have to think in those terms. We cannot deliver if we don't have Oxford, Cambridge, Art firing on all cylinders and delivering. And one of the things we, we strongly encourage the government to is really double down and commit to the art project. That is something that business are ready to invest in. 
We know that there is a huge international appetite around the ARC, and it's an absolutely key requirement. We want the government to really full square get behind the ARC rather than watering it down. There is no question about offsetting and trading. That just isn't uh, on the table. And so what we want to do is make sure that every area is bringing themselves up and being able to power up uh, in the way we've talked about as well. The second question was uh, um, uh, around um, making sure that um, all areas are, are, are benefiting. And I think this point is very important. Clusters is just one of the tool, uh, uh, tools in the box. It's not the only one. And we need to make sure that we are properly thinking these things through. I'm very interested as part of our Thriving Regions and Nations program to explore the opportunity for our rural and coastal communities and our rural and coastal businesses. I think that's an untapped, uh, untapped area of economic power that we can get behind, not just in terms of net zero and other energy opportunities, but also some really key issues around agriculture and future food, food security for our country, and also the way in which those sectors can really transform other industries as a result of that. So I think that there are real roles to play in these other nascent uh, uh, industries that may be within rural and coastal areas. And we will be doing some more work on that and be really keen to engage with members on that agenda. And then finally, the issue of clusters in terms of if you're not a geography, I've just described, for example, the satellite technologies earlier, and that integrated five different localities and many more potentially. So clusters are not just in a geography, geographical way. There's also obviously opportunities around the technology or around a particular nascent sector as well that will have common supply chains that bind them together as well. And so we want to be thinking in those terms as well. And, and Ahmed, sorry, did a very good job. For, forgive me, Stephanie, I, just, I didn't do a very good job of just relaying Ruth's question. Ruth Gawthorpe had asked this question and just to put it in her terms. How can we encourage more businesses to employ people remotely hybrid in parts of the country like Cornwall? Can levelling up assist? And I don't know whether levelling up is going to help with that. Will it? I think it can, but it's an interesting dynamic and it's something that's come up in our regional councils uh, in the latest round that we were talking about. A number of areas were actually, uh, regional council identified, and actually they've seen a recent trend where hybrid working has seen them lose talent where people are staying within the localities, but actually being attracted to salaries substantially greater, say in the London or the Southeast region. And so people are being pulled because of the, the high uh, skill shortages to move to those um, businesses, but still remain located where they live. So one of the things we want to do as part of this agenda is really look at how we can retain talent and be employed by local businesses and regional businesses as well to grow those uh, regional economies as well. Stephanie, sorry, I cut you off. Yeah, well, I think it links to that question from Ruth, but also the previous point around do clusters need to be geographically together? Um, if there are any positives that have come out of the difficult time we've had through the terrible time for many in the pandemic, it, it, it is that acceleration of being able to work remotely, use technology to form communities. And that's another way that I think clustering can help. People don't have to be, as I said, connected geographically. The technology um, allows us to get there if we can be clear about these are these are ways of connecting people in that in that way. If you see what I mean, we we can use technology to get the people that are talking about space that might be in disparate areas who didn't know about each other to leverage and work together better. Can I, there are a couple of other questions which are about specific government interventions, and Stephanie, one is for you, and the other I think is for both of you. Um, Thomas Barton asked a question about business rates. And Stephanie, this is obviously something you'll have thought a good deal about, and whether or not the you know proposed changes to business rates are going to be enough to bring life back to the high street. What's your read on that? Well, everything we're seeing in the retail sector is really that that it has sort of turned a corner and is now increasing, and it's very much about experience. I think that the way that um, leases are being structured and, and that's a big part of, of also the cost of, of running a business are, are helping which are more tied into the performance of the overall business. Um, so I think we, we're going to see what happens. It probably wasn't as much of a dramatic change as many were hoping for. Um, but we are seeing a number of high streets starting to rebound in the last few months uh, and really have much more footfall again. So. Um, you know, that experience that people have been missing for a couple of years uh, is an opportunity and a lot more of that is localised than it, than it was perhaps in city centres. So there's a bit of a rebalance and, and still some things to be seen on that. And I think business rates is part of that overall equation. And, and are you seeing, Stephanie, a related question, this move in terms of the anecdotal thing that you've heard about people moving out of cities and towns and the 
that being reflected both in residential property prices and, and in some commercial property prices. It, does that seem like it's a fundamental shift or a sort of post-pandemic blip? It, it's, it, I don't think it's a fundamental shift. I think cities and towns are still going to be incredibly relevant. Um, we have seen small examples of where it's made a, a difference that was a what I would describe as a bit more of a blip. It may have a longer term rise in prices for a period of time, but ultimately um, I think there's another force that we, we probably haven't given thought to, in fact we've done some research on this recently, that if you go back to skills and you look at the ageing population and where skills will become more concentrated as we move through and, and over the next decade, We'll only have, we'll see more concentration of talent into cities and towns, particularly cities. Really, that's interesting. That's really interesting. So it's one of those things, you, you know, you always want to look at what the chart looks like for the decade rather than for the year, don't you? Um, yes. Um, I, I just um, want to come back to one one other question, which is. Uh, uh, come from uh, Angus King Davis, and it's about what specific regulatory changes government needs to make to enable levelling up. And actually, if I can add one of my own, I don't know whether you have a kind of to-do list for government on regulatory changes. But if CBI members feel like, okay, the, you know, the government's talking about this, but if they just did X or Y heaven knows it would make a difference to my business life. How do they engage in your process so that that happens? So there's a couple of things that we would like to see straight away. One is making the super deduction permanent, and we would like to see that improve to attract and give confidence to business investment. We're also very keen that the apprenticeship levy is reformed so that we can actually create a much better skills investment fund. And we also think there are significant opportunities around uh, uh, regulatory reform that will attract more investment into our net zero agenda around hydrogen, for example, and carbon capture, which would be absolutely transformative for jobs right across the country. Those are just a few to begin with. Also, some Im improved investments in R&D tax credits that can encourage businesses to invest more in innovation as well. I think in all of these areas, the CBI teams are working very hard, uh, working with government officials and directly with ministers and with the Treasury right now. So any thoughts and reflections from members and on this call um, on suggestions where we think we should be pushing harder, please get send them through. Um, we've got a very good uh, open conversation going on right now with the Treasury and with others. So it's a good time to be pushing on this. The Chancellor indicated at the spring statement that he wants to really focus on, on key areas around regulation and tax that are focused around unlocking capital around people and also ideas and other investments over the course of the next couple of months that then could hit the autumn uh, statement. So it's a really key time for this uh, 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 engagement that we get the ideas and reflections from members. The other part on the levelling up side, of course, is that there is a cabinet committee that is overseeing this whole agenda that the Prime Minister is chairing. And a very strong steer to us through uh, officials and also through Andy Haldane and others was to make sure that businesses are strongly engaged through the steer co that Stephanie's chairing to feed in specific policy challenges that we think could really unlock and help to deliver on levelling up as well. So again, in those areas as well, particularly James, where I think a couple of questions have been cited where potentially policies are pulling in different directions could undermine levelling up. We want to hear about those. We want to understand what those are so we can really advance those into discussions with government and the cabinet committee as well. Right. I, I mean, thank you, Stephanie, I'm just going to say one thing, I'm going to give you the last word, but I don't know whether it's a measure of the power of your new job or just the foresight that you have, but it turns out the next week's CBI 10 is focused specifically on skills. So we're going to be discussing that at that, at that time. But I just, I just wanted genuinely to give you the last word and, and ask if, if you're a business, if you're a CBI member and you want to engage with you personally or the steering committee on this, you know, what can people actually do to participate in it? Well, we'll make sure there's a way, and I'm sure there is already on the on the CBI website that they can they can connect. Um, all views welcome, uh, all um, participation welcome. You know, even if you're not sitting on the steering committee, bringing forward your your the way you want to get involved, I think is really important. And the questions that you have, and as ever, I, you know, Ahmed would say this, I'm sure, and as would Tony, the CBI is there for its members. And so hearing from businesses what's important to them. I do think I would be remiss if I didn't circle back on something I said earlier um, in terms of planning would be the other ask, I think, for many businesses, particularly in my sector, in the real estate sector, which is why I, I would be remiss not saying it. But ultimately, we, regeneration is very closely linked to levelling up. 
And we need places where people want to live, they want to work and they want to play. And um, if it takes many, many, many years to do that, to get through the planning system, then we're slowing down the opportunity to, to get investment into an area. So um, I, that was the previous answer, but yeah, come and get involved, do connect, really interested to hear the different views. It's very good to end on a note that is concrete, practical, and you know, let's go on and do it. Um, uh, Armin Koga and Stephanie Hyde, thank you very much for sparing the time. Thank you very much everyone on the CBI side for making time for this conversation. Uh, as I said, uh, next week, CBI 10 on skills. Uh, have a good day and a good week.